freshness. I had exhausted my emotion. Indeed, as I went about my business, I found myself wondering at my intense excitement overnight. I made a careful examination of the ground about the little lawn. I wasted some time in futile questionings, conveyed as well as I was able. to watch. 
much long. I am too occidental for a long vigil. I could work at a problem for years. But to wait inactive for 24 hours, that is another matter. I got up after a time and began walking aimlessly through the bushes towards the hill again. Patience, said I to myself. If you want your machine again, you must leave that sphinx alone. If they mean to take your machine away, it's little good you're wrecking their bronze panels. And if they don't, you will get it back as soon as you can ask for it. To sit among all those unknown things before a puzzle like that is hopeless. That way lies monomania. Face this world, learn its ways, watch it, be careful of too hasty guesses at its meaning. In the end, you will find clues to it. Then suddenly the humor of the situation came into my mind. The thought of the years I had spent in study and toil to get into the future age, and now my passion of anxiety to get out of it. I'd made myself the most complicated and the most hopeless trap that a man ever devised. Although it was at my own expense, I could not help myself. I laughed aloud. Going through the big palace, it seemed to me that the little people avoided me. It may have been my fancy, or it may have had something to do with my hammering at the gates of bronze. Yet, I felt tolerably sure of the avoidance. I was careful, however, to show no concern and to abstain from any pursuit of them. And in the course of a day or two, things got back to the old footing. I made what progress I could in the language, and in addition I pushed my explorations here and there. Either I missed some subtle point, or their language was excessively simple, almost exclusively composed of concrete substantives and verbs. There seemed to be few, if any, abstract terms, or little use of figurative language. Their sentences were usually simple and of two words, and I failed to convey or understand any but the simplest propositions. I determined to put the thought of my time machine and the mystery of the bronze doors under the Sphinx as much as possible in a corner of memory, until my growing knowledge would lead me back to them in a natural way. Yet a certain feeling you may understand in a circle of a few miles around the point of my arrival. So far as I could see, all the world displayed the same exuberant richness as the Thames Valley. From every hill I climbed, I saw the same abundance of splendid buildings, endlessly varied in material and style. The same clustering thickets of evergreens, the same blossom laden trees and tree ferns. Here and there water shone like silver, and beyond, the land rose into blue undulating hills, and so faded into the serenity of the sky. A peculiar feature which presently attracted my attention was the presence of certain circular wells. Several, as it seemed to me, of a very great depth. One lay by the path up the hill, which I had followed during my first walk. Like the others, it was rimmed with bronze, curiously wrought, and protected by a little cupola on the rain. From the rain. Sitting by the side of these wells, and peering down into the shafted darkness, I could see no gleam of water, nor could I start to any reflection with a lighted match. But in all of them, I heard a certain
in half playful fashion in eating fruit and sleeping. I cannot see how things were kept going. Then again, about the time machine, something I knew not what had taken it into the hollow pedestal of the White Sphinx. Why? For the life of me I could not imagine. Those waterless wells, too, those flickering pillars. I felt I lacked a clue. I felt, how shall I put it? Suppose you found an inscription with sentences here and there in excellent plain English and interpolated therewith others made up of words, of letters, even absolutely unknown to you. Well, on the third day of my visit, that was how the world of eight hundred and two thousand seven hundred and one presented itself to me. That day, too, I made a friend of a sort. It happened that as I was watching some of the little people bathing in a shallow, one of them was seized with cramp and began drifting.
agreeably that I was drowned, and that sea anemones were feeling over my face with their soft palps. I woke. I woke with a start, and with an odd fancy that some grayish animal had just rushed out of the chamber. I tried to get to sleep again, but I felt restless and uncomfortable. It was that dim gray hour when things are just creeping out of darkness, when everything is colorless and clear-cut and yet unreal. I got up and went down into the great hall, and so out upon the flagstones in front of the palace. I thought I would make a virtue of necessity and see the sunrise. The moon was setting, and the dying moonlight and the first pallor of dawn were mingled in a ghastly half-light. The bushes were inky black, the ground a somber gray, the sky colorless and cheerless, and up by the hill I thought I could see ghosts. Three several times as I scanned the slope, I saw white figures. Twice I fancied I saw a solitary white, ape-like creature running rather quickly up the hill, and once near, near the ruins I saw a leash of them carrying some dark body. They moved hastily and did not see what became of them. It seemed that they vanished among the bushes. The dawn was still indistinct. You must understand, I was feeling that chill, uncertain, early morning feeling you must have known. I doubted my eyes. 
and sliding to a new adjustment. I had now a clue. 
capacity for reflecting light are common features of nocturnal things. Witness the owl and the cat. And last of all, that evident confusion in the sunshine, that hasty yet fumbling awkward flight toward dark shadow, and that peculiar carriage of the head while in the light, all reinforce the theory of an extreme sensitiveness of the retina.
weeks. My explanation may be absolutely wrong. I still think it is the most plausible. The most plausible one. But even on this supposition, the balanced civilization that was at last attained must have long since passed its zenith and was now far fallen into decay. The too perfect security of the upper worlders had led them to a slow movement of degradation, to a general dwindling in size, strength, and intelligence that I could see clearly enough already. What had happened to the undergrounders I did not yet suspect, but from what I had seen of the Morlocks, that, by the by, was the name by which these creatures were called. I could imagine that the modification of the human type was even far more profound than, the Hmong, than among the Eloi, the beautiful race that I already knew. Then came troublesome doubts. Why had the Morlocks taken my time machine? For I felt sure it was they who had taken it. Why, too, if the Eloi were masters, could they not restore the machine to me? And why were they so terribly afraid of the dark? I proceeded, as I have said, to question Weena about this underworld, but here again I was disappointed. At first she would not understand my questions, and presently she refused to answer them. She shivered, as though the topic was unendurable. And when I pressed her, perhaps a little harshly, she burst into tears. They were the only tears, except my own, I ever saw in that golden age. When I saw them, I ceased abruptly to trouble about the Morlocks, and was only concerned in banishing these signs of the human inheritance from Weena's eyes. And very soon she was smiling and clapping her hands, while I solemnly burned a match. as we can